So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our uh, Paasa Distinguished Lectures. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, so we Paasa is an organization of Philippine and American scientists and engineers um, of Filipino descent, um, but now we're not limited to the Philippines and the US. We also have members now from um, Aust Australia and other regions of the world. And we're conducting these activities to really try and strengthen the collaboration between um, academics, researchers, and scientists um, in the Philippines and try to strengthen our foundation here in the country. So for this morning, I'd like to call the president of PAASE, uh, Professor Gisela Concepcion, to give an opening remark and to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Kay. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, in this PAASE Distinguished Lecture uh, Series, which uh, Kay hosts every now and then, and it's interspersed with our other Friday activities like our webinar hosted, uh, our rec hosted webinars and our fireside chats and other activities. Today, I'm uh, very honored and pleased to introduce a woman scientist, uh, a world leader in her field who has uh, made a major contribution to a uh, Philippine-based research in terms of producing many publications and training many Filipino scientists. This is Professor Dr. Margot Haygood. Let me tell you a bit about her education. So um, she started in 1973 with a microbial ecology course in uh, Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory. And then in 1976, she finished her Bachelor of Arts, major in history and science. And if I recall, there was like an English component of it, I'm not sure, at Harvard University, magna cum laude. In 1979 to 1981, she was a Mambusha scholar at Tokyo University's Misaki Marine Biological Station. So even then, Margot had this great interest in Asia. And she knows many things about Japanese culture. In 1984, she completed her PhD in marine biology, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. In marine biology, and her advisor was Kenneth Nielsen. Under an NSF or National Science Foundation graduate fellowship. And in 1991, uh, she participated again in a molecular evolution workshop. Marine Biological Laboratory of Woods Hole. Her research interests, many of you might know of it already, is marine microbiology and marine biotechnology. In particular, marine invertebrate symbiosis is well known for in-depth studies of marine invertebrate symbiosis, particularly the association between the bryozoa and bugler Neritana and its symbiote endobuculus sertula, which produces the anti-cancer bryostatins to protect the bryozoans offspring from predation. Due in large part to her work, this is now the best understood example of a marine chemical defense bios symbiosis. And more recently, She's demonstrated that shipworm symbionts, in addition to their known nutritional role, also contribute bioactive secondary metabolites to the association. And uh, we'll see lots of examples today at Margot's talk. So Margot, you can have the floor now. And thank you so much for agreeing to give this talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Giselle. It's a real pleasure to be here. The uh, 
Um, the talk that I'm going to give is the foundation of it is a, um, a collaboration that I've had with Giselle for over 10 years, and you will see her fingerprints throughout. So the subject of, of this talk is a type of animal called a shipworm, and you can see a bottle of a shipworm here on the first, uh, on the first slide. Um, I will mention slide numbers um, in case someone is following along on the PDF that I sent in case there's a, uh, some sort of a problem with the um, uh, internet speed. So the second slide um, is showing what a shipworm looks like when it's living in, inside of its burrow in the wood. So this is a piece of wood that has been chipped open using um, carpenter's tools. And uh, you can see the shipworm with its head inside the wood over here and the tail end of it over here. When you look at a piece of wood that's infested with shipworms, you don't really see the shipworm. What you see are the siphons, which are pumping water into and uh, through the shipworm, just the way a clam does. This is the third slide. Fourth slide shows another shipworm out of its burrow. And you can see these numbers here, which are the, the wonderful system that we developed in our joint project for tracking all of the specimens and all of the strains that we isolated. So shipworms are bivalve mollusks. Their family is called the pteridinidae, and they're close relatives of clams. So on the fifth slide, I'm showing uh, some sort of historical information about shipworms. Um, they became of interest to scientists in particular after this disastrous flood in the, in the Netherlands due to shipworm infestation of, of wooden dikes, which had something to do with the change in salinity uh, of the marine regime at that time. It's also of note that it's frequently um, asserted that shipworms were part of the reason that the Spanish Armada, which it tried to invade England in 1588, uh, failed to do so because they spent a lot of time in port and shipworms weakened the ships. And then there was a terrible storm and there's this wonderful painting down here of the flagship um, falling to pieces in a terrible storm. So the high, the heyday of shipworms was in the 19th century. As you can see from this little graph over here, this is a n-gram analysis, a Google n-gram analysis, which is quite a fun thing to do. And you can see that once ships no, were no longer made of wood, interest in shipworms declined tremendously. But in recent years, we've become interested in them again. So to put them in the context on slide six here, um, this is a, a, a a schematic evolutionary tree of the group. And you can see that their closest relatives are other clams like the culinary clams that we're all familiar with. The folads, which are small clams that bore in rock, but do not bore in wood. Um, and then the Zalophageids, which are deep sea wood eating clams and they have symbiotic bacteria along with the pteridinids. So the Xylophageids and pteridinids are sister groups that both have symbiotic bacteria that help them to eat wood. And it, the most ancient groups are the tropical mangrove specialists. And these were not studied very well because most of the shipworm specialists in, in uh, Europe in particular were, uh, didn't have access to these tropical mangrove specialists. And so the work that we were able to do in um, our project in the Philippines with Giselle's group gave us access to this group of, of shipworms that had been very poorly studied before. The ones that have been studied more are these generalist shipworms that are invasive species all over the world. Um, and those we'll be talking about both types further on. The one that's in red, Cufus polythalami, I don't have time to talk about in this presentation, but it's a remarkable giant shipworm that does not live in wood and has uh, sulfide oxidizing symbionts, unlike all other shipworms. 
So the basic schematic of a shipworm, this is the anterior end, and this is deep in the wood, and the, the particles of wood that are being drilled by the shells at the head go, go into the mouth at this end. The water flows in over the gills and then back out carrying waste products with it. The intestine, which is in, in, in green here, has an, uh, an out pocketing called the cecum, which is the wood digestion organ. And this, this organ is where the wood particles are placed while they are digested. And this little, and the red, the red part is the gill, uh, which extends depending on the shipworm anywhere from half to the entire length of the body. And this little box shows uh, what, what I will show from the, um, in the next slide. Um, so, oh, actually it's not the next slide, it's a later one. So this shows the structure of the gill and the interlamellar junctions, these black blobs are where the bacteria reside. It may sound funny that, um, that an animal is hosting large numbers of bacteria inside the cells of its gill, but this has actually arisen multiple times in evolution in the bivalves. So they are very promiscuous in terms of inviting bacteria into their gills. You can see these, these uh, interlamellar junctions and the, uh, the uh, dark staining bacteria sites. And what's staining darkly, the light, the light uh, voids are the nucleus and all the rest of it is uh, bacteria. So we can, we can investigate this by using um, um, fluorescently labeled ribosomal RNA probes these are universal probes that show you all the bacteria in the system. And this is the, the box that I showed you uh, before. So you can see the gill is at the top right and the cecum is at the lower left and the intestine is in between. And what you can see is that in the cecum, the wood digestion organ, there are very few bacteria. Maybe you can see a little micro colony down here of maybe three cells. On the right are the negative control images. So you can see there's some autofluorescence of the wood itself, but the very, very few bacteria. In the intestine, there are more bacteria, but still not nearly as much as the gill, where you have this remarkable, intense fluorescence from the huge numbers of bacteria that are in the gill. So most of the bacterial population of the, of the shipworm resides in the gill. So in bivalves, um, most bivalves are filter feeders. They capture particles on their gills as water passes over. So when you say gills, you think respiration, but in bivalves, it's also feeding. Five bivalve families have intracellular gamma proteobacterial symbionts in the gills. So as I said, they're promiscuous in terms of, of um, inviting bacteria into their gills. Most of these bivalve symbionts are either sulfide oxidizing chemoautotrophs or methanotrophs. The shipworms are remarkably, mar remarkable because almost all of them, the symbionts are cellulolytic. This means that they are heterotrophic. So the, the chemoautotrophic symbionts are fixing carbon like a plant. The uh, cellulolytic symbionts are breaking down cellulose in the wood uh, like any other heterotroph. So here's a picture of a bacteria site and all of this stringy material in here is bacteria. It's phenomenal, the number of bacteria that they host. So back in 1983, John Waterbury at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution isolated the first bacterial symbiont in pure culture. And this is a picture from that, uh, from that publication. And he did the very, the clever thing of making a soft auger uh, culture with, without any nitrogen, because wood is very poor in nitrogen, and with particulate cellulose, that's the clouding material down here. And this line is the bacteria that grow below the surface, and you can see they are breaking down the cellulose. And the key point is that this means that these bacteria have the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen which, will, which is something they can do to help their host uh, deal with 
the nutritional insufficiency of wood, which is very low in nitrogen. Furthermore, they can break down cellulose, which most animals can't do. So they look like ordinary bacteria on this plate here. And in 2009, um, the, uh, the genome was sequenced. Um, we also, at that point, started the, uh, the Philippine Mollusk Symbiont ICBG. This is a project that with uh, Giselle, as well as um, uh, several other scientists, including Eric Schmidt at University of Utah, Baldomero Oliveira, who I'm sure many of you know, also at the University of Utah, Gary Rosenberg, who's a malacologist, and Dan Distel, who is a marine microbiologist and close colleague of mine. And the purpose of this project was to do biodiversity-based discovery combined with scientific development of the host country. And as Giselle said, it was remarkably successful, both in terms of publishing many scientific papers, but also uh, training more than 40 uh, Philippine scientists. Since uh, the time of, since 1983, when John Waterbury isolated the first strains of Pteridinobacter turneri, for, for a long time, that was the only thing that could be isolated from shipworm gills, even though there was molecular evidence that there were other bacteria there as well. In the, in the Philippine um, Mollusk Symbiont Project based at UP, we were able to isolate multiple different species of bacterial symbionts, all of them related to each other, all of them falling into this group, but um, a, a, a diverse group of bacterial symbionts that inhabit the gills of shipworms. And we're now in the process of starting to describe some of these species. Interestingly, the symbionts in the gills occupy the bacteria sites in a patchwork fashion. So this is showing that, that in, ba in Banchia cetacea, which is a, 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 a Northwest Pacific shipworm, the green um, isolate is labeled in green in, the, um, in these images. And then the, the red isolate is labeled in red. And then the yellow shows where, um, where the, uh, where they overlap. And you can see that each, each strain of bacteria, each species occupies its own specific bacteria site. So there's some sort of territory or competition within the gill amongst these different symbionts. They are able to fix nitrogen. This is a, a, a multiple isotope imaging mass spectrometry study, which shows the red color here shows the the nitrogen uh, N15 that is being um, fixed and uh, brought into the, the shipworm by the bacterial symbionts and then transferred to the host in the form of amino acids. And their ability to, to digest cellulose is quite remarkable. This shows Wattman filter paper being completely dissolved by shipworm symbionts. So the genome uh, came out in 2009, and it was a, uh, a major effort that was led by Dan Distel, who's one of the, who was one of the participants in the Philippine Mollusk Symbiont ICBG program um, and has been collaborating with us for a, for a long time. And the, the most amazing thing that came out of that paper was the finding that Pteridinobacter turneri, in addition to having a tremendous repertoire of cellulases for breaking down wood and the and having the nitrogenases for fixing nitrogen also has numerous secondary metabolite pathways comparable to the kind of, of numbers that you find in act actinobacteria. This was a total surprise and it suggested that symbionts of shipworms could be a source of novel natural products and a new uh, system for studying met these metabolite symbioses because Unlike the bryozoan that Giselle mentioned um, at the beginning, these bacteria can be cultivated and studied in the laboratory, which uh, makes a lot of things possible. So we began to think about why perhaps this um, mild-mannered nutritional symbiont might have all these weapons. What's going on? Uh, it was a completely a new view of this symbiosis. 
So we based our project on this symbiont rationale, the idea being that compared to a random um, environmental bacteria like soil bacteria, for example, bacteria that are consistently living inside of a host are more likely to act on relevant targets, relevant to human disease with minimal toxicity because they have to, they can't kill off their host and with favorable pharmacodynamics for their for compounds to be distributed throughout the system. Furthermore, the symbiotic habitats can contain bacterial species and strains that don't overlap with those from other sources. So, that's a, so it's a whole new group of organisms with new pathways and new compounds to be investigated. So that was the rationale behind the project. And we found very uh, fairly soon um, some antimicrobials that were produced by turnabout Teridinobacter turnerae, we discovered them based on their activity against bacteria, the tartalons. Um, but it turns out that they have exquisite potency against um, parasites such as crypto, cryptosporidium and malaria. And these are actually now under development. So this is kind of our concept of what maybe is happening in the shipboard. First, so you have this compartment, the gill, where you have multiple symbionts and you may have competition among them that could involve my antimicrobial compounds. We know that the bacteria are producing um, cellulases that are then transported into the cecum. This, we, uh, this has been shown uh, by work in Dan Distel's lab. And so we wonder whether maybe some secondary metabolites, antimicrobials might also be uh, transported to the cecum and might help to account for the fact that we see virtually no bacteria in the wood digestion organ, organ of this animal. So think about it. You have cellulose, you have little particles of wood going in there. You have cellulose being broken down. What does that produce? It produces sugar. So you have a rich sugar solution in this organ and you have seawater coming in along with the wood. Why wouldn't bacteria bloom in this system and consume the, uh, the cellulose, as you would see in an or organism like a termite, um, yet we don't see this. So maybe there's a role for antimicrobial compounds in, uh, in this system. So to make a very long story short, uh, kind of the culmination of the data that was gathered through the, uh, the Philippine project, which I have to say that the Philippines is paradise for shipworms. It has all the shipworms and is the, you know, one of the best places in the world to study them. Um, plus work by my, my collaborator, um, Amaro Trindad Silva, who was a graduate student in my lab and is, and is a, a Brazilian scientist. So we had, so we had um, information from Brazil and then also from the US. We were able to do a mega examination of all the secondary metabolite pathways in the metagenomes of the gills and also in the isolate genomes of the numerous bacteria that we've isolated from shipworms. So what we wanted to investigate is whether or not we're able to isolate all the symbionts in pure culture. That is, are the isolates that we obtain representative of the, uh, the microbiome of the, of the shipworm gill. Um, we also wanted to investigate what we, what we conjectured based on the genome of the single strain of Teridinobacter turnerae back in 2009. Is it really a rich source of new compounds that we can access through these isolates? That was the purpose of this study. And you can see some Familiar name, Giselle was a, was a co-author on this paper and Marvin and Ai are uh, UP uh, former students. So we had the shipworms collected in the Philippines, the ones in Brazil and the ones in the US. Uh, seven shipworm species, 22 gill metagenomes and 23 bacterial isolate genomes that we were able to uh, compare. So first of all, we wanted to know, are the gill community members and the isolates, uh, are the isolates representative of the gill community? 
So we took the metagenomes and we binned those, which it are always going to be incomplete fragmented genomes, and then compared those bins to the well-assembled isolate genomes uh, and using genome-wide average nucleotide identity and alignment fraction, we were able to say how similar are those metagenome bins to the isolates. And this is a widely accepted method of determining relatedness among bacteria. So what we found is all the major symbionts are represented by isolates at the species and frequently the strain level. So our isolates are a good mirror of what's in the community in nature. Furthermore, each shipworm species has a characteristic suite of symbionts that differ from, but can overlap with other shipworm species. That means every time you, you isolate bacteria from a new shipworm species, you're going to find new and interesting things. And this ability to bring the entire community into lab culture is unprecedented among multi-symbiont systems. So this is a, a bar graph that shows all of the different shipworms up here, and then the bacteria down here, and the distribution among them. So CUFIS is the one that I told you that is a, a sulfide oxidizing chemosynthetic symbiosis, and it has a very distinct sulfide oxidizing symbiont. Then we have, say, Bactrinophorus, which is this magnificent giant mangrove eating shipworm, and it has almost exclusively a single type of bacteria represented by strain 2753L, which is, has more secondary metabolite pathways than any other um, shipworm isolate. And then we have Neoterito radii, the magnificent giant shipworm of Brazil, which is dominated by Teratinobacter ternary, our old friend, but also has some other bacteria as well. And then we have other situations in, in other shipworms. So this shows you how much diversity there is. This is showing the, um, the average nucleotide identity comparisons of the metagenome bins with the symbiont isolate genomes. And this is very strong evidence that we have isolated the bacteria that exist in the metagenomes. So then we decided to look at the secondary metabolite pathways in these guild communities. Uh, we wanted to know about the abundance, variety, and novelty of the natural product pathways, evaluate their correspondence to the pathways in the isolates. Are the isolates that we have actually representative of the secondary metabolite diversity in the gills? Um, we know that the bacteria at the strain level are, but what about the pathways? So we took these assemblies from the metagenome bills, bins and the isolate genomes. We an analyzed them by anti-SMASH, which is a commonly used tool for finding secondary metabolite pathways. And we only looked at the well-documented pathway classes, um, such as uh, uh, polyketide synthases and non-ribosomal uh, peptide synthases. So this is likely a substantial underestimate of the true abundance and novelty. And, and if you read the paper, you'll see that we give some examples of, of unusual pathways that don't get caught in this net. Um, so of course, in the metagenome bins, these pathways are going to be in fragments. Um, whereas in the, in the isolate genomes, you're going to have the whole pathway properly assembled. So we were able to compare the pathway fragments in the metagenome bill, bins to the complete pathways in the isolates, which allows much more rigorous identification and analysis of what we have. So what we find is that about 75% of the pathways that we can find in the metagenomes are shared by the isolate genomes. So the reason that this this bubble is much bigger than this one is because these are fragments of pathways and these are full intact pathways, but we can map the uh, metagenome pathways onto the intact pathways and be sure that they're the same. We find some pathways in our isolates that we haven't seen yet in a metagenome and there are about 25% of the pathways that we haven't found yet in an isolate. Um, but that's an argument for continuing to sequence the genomes of more symbiont, uh, of more isolated symbionts from shipworms. Less than 5% of these pathways are similar to, to, to those 
from known compounds. Many of those will be new compounds. Some of them could be known compounds where no pathway was known. That was the case for the tartarlons I showed earlier, the boron complexing um, antiparasitic compound. So we see a, a, a very abundant pathways in some of the isolates and other isolates have very small numbers. The, the sulfide oxidizers have very few. Um, um, we, uh, we took all of the uh, biosynthetic gene clusters, that's what BGC means, and GCF means gene cluster family. So these are the individual clusters and these are the groups of related clusters. Um, and uh, those who are the biosynthetic gene clusters that group into a single gene cluster family are likely to encode, encode similar secondary metabolites. So if we look at these um, gene cluster families in the metagenomes and how they are distributed among, um, among the host species. So this is the number of metagenomes. This is the gene cluster families along the bottom and the colors are the different species of shipworms. We can see that there are a few gene cluster families that are very widespread. And then there's a very long tail. So there's a lot of unique uh, gene clusters that will produce compounds that are sporadic, whereas these are probably compounds that we found in the majority of shipworms. And that's blown up here, where you can see gene cluster family three is the one that is the most widespread. And then we have some others of interest. Gene cluster family 11 is the tartralons, which I showed you before, the, the, uh, the boron complexing compound. Gene cluster family eight is the uh, catechylate siderophores. And gene cluster family one is the one I'll be talking about toward the end. So if you take these gene cluster families and you do a network analysis based on multi-gene BLAST, you can see, first of all, the relatedness, for example, in gene cluster family one, we see that it, the, so the, the bacterial isolates are gray dots, and then all the colored dots are metagenomes from different shipworms. So you can see that that, that this occurs in a lot of different shipworms and in many of our isolates. Um, in some cases, for example, GCF11, which is the tartalons here, the boron complexing compounds, it's found in many isolates, but we only see it in a few metagenomes. That's because this particular type of analysis is not very sensitive. So it's great for showing you relatedness. And you know, there's some interesting kind of outlying clusters here in GCF1, you know, how similar are the compounds made by these clusters to the ones in the main cluster? Those are kind of questions. GCF8, as I said, is the, is the catechylate siderophore cluster. But because, and you can see down here, we have many singletons. These are very, these are interesting um, pathways that are occurring, you know, we've only seen once or twice. Um, and they contribute a lot to the chemical diversity of this. So this is very interesting and important, but um, not totally satisfactory, as I said, because we know that every, since GCF11, which is the tartalon pathway, occurs in every pteridinobacter ternary strain that we've looked at, it should occur in every shipworm that contains pteridinobacter ternary. So we did um, uh, another analysis of using the, the GCFs from the cultivated isolates searched against the metagenome contigs. And this, in that case, you can see GCF11, which is the tartalons, occurs in, in all pteridinobacter ternary strains. That's what the one means. It's 100% in all pteridinobacter ternary strains. And it's also found in every single um, specimen that contains uh, pteridinobacter ternary. So that's uh, that's what we would expect to see. So this is a more sensitive analysis, but it lacks the, the dimension of, sim of similarity that we get from the network analysis. Um, but we will talk a bit more about GCF1 later on. Um, so we decided to, to look both for the, pro for the product of GCF1, also GS GCF3, but we haven't found that yet, so I won't talk about it. But those are ones that are 
very widespread. And so we suspect are important for the symbiosis, maybe important for maintaining the sterility of the, of the cecum. So from the pathway, we know it's a lipopeptide. We know how big it is. And we know the identity of some of the amino acids from looking at the adenylation domains within the NRPS um, genes. However, mass spectrometry of conventional extracts didn't lead us to the molecule. We couldn't see it. But Bailey Miller, who is the lead author on the, on the paper, noticed there was a very heavy boundary layer in the extraction between the water and ethyl acetate portions of, the, of one of the extractions that he, that he was doing on the cell pellet. And on investigating this boundary, the boundary layer, it should be, this should say layer, um, um, he found that there were lipopeptides concentrated in this layer because they're amphiphilic and they don't really wanna go into either the water or the ethyl acetate. And the product of GCF1 was isolated from this layer. So it was, it was what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make here is that normally when we do um, discovery of bioactive secondary metabolite products, we take a crude extract, we throw it into a bunch of assays, and then we follow the fractions that have activity in the assay. In this case, we knew we wanted to find this particular molecule from this particular pathway. We have no idea what it does, no idea if it has any activity at all. We wanted it, and so we went after it, and Bailey was clever enough to figure out how to, how to get his hands on this molecule. Once it's purified, it's very well behaved from a chemical point of view. Um, it was just very difficult to isolate and uh, in, invisible in the initial crude extracts. So the question is, what is that compound and what is its activity? So the product of it is what we call Turner cyclomycins, which is a, cyc a cyclic peptide with a lipid tail. It has some interesting structural features, some um, epimerizations and hydroxylations. We'll talk a bit more about that. This is a paper that is not actually completely out, but is, has just been released online after all the revisions and so forth. There was a preprint that was out for about a year before that. This is the link that will lead you to the, uh, to the online in-press version. Um, and so you can see that Bailey Miller was the, is the guy who figured out how to get this molecule. Um, Albeb Lim is another person from, from UP who's uh, done all of the activity work. Senjun Lin is uh, um, a research professor who works with Eric Schmidt who did all of the bioinformatics on it for us. And then we've had a lot of help from other people tying up all of the loose ends. So here are the Turner cyclomycins. They're cyclic lipopeptides. They all, the variants among them are all in this lipid tail. So A, B, C, and D are, are simply different in the lipid tail. The, the head group, it, um, the peptide is the same in all cases. Has some interesting, weird amino acids that are relatively rare um, in natural products. And certainly I don't know of anything that has this combination of them. Um, and I, I won't try to describe the torture trying to, trying to determine all of the um, stereochemistry. Um, there's one stereocenter that's still un, unknown. So this pathway is highly conserved and present in all T. ternary strains, suggesting that, that it, it may be quite important for the symbiosis. This is an analysis of the adenylation domains from these eight uh, different pathways that we investigated, showing that, that the adenylation domains map very closely to each other um, throughout the entire pathway. What this means is that we expect the same amino acids to be in the peptide portion in all strains. We don't expect a lot of variation in the peptide portion. Fortunately, the, if you do uh, an analysis of the um, domains within the peptides, within the ORFs, within the pathway, uh, you can rationalize the biosynthesis of this molecule quite nicely. The, um, the adenylation domains select the right amino acids in the right order. 
the D amino acids have um, epimerases within the module that's responsible for them. And then we have some additional um, accessory genes that are hydroxylases that can account for the hydroxylations. So of course we wanted to see if it had any activity against uh, human pathogens and um, found out quite soon that it does, uh, particularly Acinetobacter baumannii. Furthermore, this is a human kidney uh, cell culture and there it's completely non-toxic to the human cells. So Acinetobacter baumannii is a nasty customer. This is a picture of it over here. It's an opportunistic pathogen from a group that is common in soils. Some people call it Arachibacter because it emerged as an important infectious disease after it began killing injured soldiers, severely injured soldiers serving in Iraq and Afghanistan who were, who were trying to recover in ICUs and would come down with this infection that was naturally resistant to practically every antibiotic. And, you know, this is what we have found also, Giselle will tell you that we've been screening this organism in uh, against thousands of extracts over the last probably about five years and find very few activities that, that will hit it. It's a real bomb-proof bug. Resistance strains then began to emerge in military hospitals, resistant to the few antibiotics that are active against it. And those infections are virtually untreatable. And it's beginning to appear in civilian ICUs after um, some military personnel wind up in civilian ICUs and bring it in there. So the CDC lists it as an urgent threat. It's one of the high priority um, bacteria that needs new antibiotics. So some people are gonna say, well, what about colistin, also known as polymyxin E? It is also a lipopeptide, cyclic lipopeptide. It's the last defense against Acinetobacter baumannii. <clears throat> so is Turnerbactin, is Turnercyclomycin just a colistin copycat? This is what we were scared of initially because if it's just the same as colistin, it's not really a step forward. It might have some utility, but it, it wouldn't help against colistin resistant strains. So Eric Schmidt very bravely got a panel of clinical strains, many of them multi-drug resistant, some of them highly resistant to colistin. And we ran our one and two, our Turner cyclomycin one and two, they just differ in their lipid tail. This is the wild type and um, it's uh, MIC is eight micrograms per mil. And you can see that even against the highly uh, colicin resistant strains, we either see no difference or in the case of, of this strain, a slight di diminution for Turner Bactin 1, but the same MIC for, for Turner Cycle, I mean, Turner Cyclomycin 2 versus Turner Cyclomycin 1. This was totally exciting because this suggests that, that the, the mechanism must be at least a bit different because um, whatever is protecting these strains uh, is not protecting them against the Turner cyclomycins. So we asked for help from Colin Manoil's lab at University of Washington. He has developed a panel of mutants of Acinetobacter bailei, which is an avirulent abalmanai model, very similar to abalmanai. And these reveal the major processes. So by looking at the morpho morphology of the cells that have been treated with Turnerbactin A and Turnerbactin B and colicin, we can um, uh, pinpoint what processes are, are being interrupted by these compounds. So DNA A, A is DNA replication, RPOC is transcription, FDSI is cell division, and these are two different aspects of outer membrane function, um, LPS, uh, lipopolysaccharide lo localization and outer membrane protein localization. And so these, outer, these ones that, have, that attack the outer membrane where the mutants are in the outer membrane processes, they create these chains of rounded cells. And that's what we see with the Turner Bactins and with the colistins. 
So this suggests that the, the I'm not Turner Bactus, I'm sorry, that's the cinereform. Turner cyclomycins and colicins both appear to target the outer membrane, but based on the results that we have with the uh, colistin resistant clinical strains, it appears to be a different mechanism. I can't tell you yet what the mechanism is. That's, you know, we're writing obviously a grant proposal to try to pursue this for, further. Um, and that's one of the things that we hope we can figure out. So this is really exciting. Turner cyclomycins are active against this very nasty um, uh, pathogen with a pretty decent MIC, including against clinical multi-drug resistant strains. So these are not like wild type strains that have been monkeyed with in the lab to create resistance. These are honest to goodness clinical strains that are making people sick. It acts against the outer membrane. We still don't know the mechanism. It's non-toxic to human cells. It's non-hemolytic, which is a common problem with lipopeptide antibiotics. So we've tested it against mouse hemocytes and it doesn't do anything to them. We're starting to work on uh, in vivo studies, which is obviously what's required if, you, if this is going to progress anywhere. And we're hoping to lead to, it will lead to a breakthrough in acinetobacter uh, balmanized treatment. So, as I'm, as I'm always saying, who needs extraterrestrial life? We have plenty of weird and wonderful creatures all around us. And trying to understand this at a deep level in terms of understanding how the ship form symbiosis works and why they have symbionts and what those symbionts are doing, possibly helping to protect the animal against um, invading uh, bacteria or, or um, in competition with, between the symbionts. It's really great to learn to understand that, but it also can lead directly to benefits to humans. We have shown in our joint work uh, with Giselle that shipworm symbionts are an incredibly valuable resource for discovery. Every host species has a distinct community. Every symbiont strain can have new pathways, all those singleton pathways I showed you in the network analysis. We looked at seven host species. It's estimated that there are 65 to 70 shipworm species. The taxonomy is a bit of a mess, but you know we're talking about there are tenfold more shipworms out there that need to be investigated. We sequenced 23 bacterial isolates, and we have a few more that we've sequenced in our new project in the Gulf of Mexico, but there are hundreds more that are in um, the collection at UP right now that can be sequenced. So there's projects for everybody to find new, new molecules and shipworms, as always, deserve more attention. So the, uh, I want to acknowledge the whole um, Philippine Mall Symbiont ICBG team at the University of the Philippines, uh, University of Utah, uh, Drexel University, Northeastern University. We've had help from the Haida tribe of native Alaskans for the shipworms that live there. The shellfish fishers of the Philippines, without which we'd never be able to collect anything. The US ICBG program, the National Science Foundation, the Brazilian government for helping me to go and work in Brazil. And our most recent project, the uh, US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is funding our work on a submerged forest in the Gulf of Mexico. So what do we still want to do? We want to discover all the compounds. We'd like to develop methods to um, encourage expression of the pathways. Some of the, some of the pathways, we haven't seen anything uh, to produced yet or to clone and express to facilitate compound isolation. We want to investigate the function of the metabolites of the symbi symbiotic system. This work, mapping the distribution and so forth was supposed to happen during the pandemic, but couldn't because we couldn't get into the lab. And then manipulate the, commu the community by introducing mutants and seeing what happens to the shipworm system. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for that presentation, Marco. Yeah, it was a very interesting um, presentation and it's, it's just wonderful to see, you know, the diversity of the shipworms and how much you can actually uh, discover from them and how much has not yet been discovered until now. 
So yeah, so I'd like to invite our uh, audience to you know type in any of your questions uh, for Margo. And I'd like to recognize also the presence of other PASI members who are here who might want to raise questions as well. So Ami Guevara, Irene Villasenor, and of course, uh, Tota Oliveira is also here. Uh, Coke Montano, Annabel Campos, Mikey Ruleda, uh, Lily Beth Salvador, Isa Yu, Wendell Rivera, uh, Yasmin Ronquillo, Lorelai Trinidad, Andrew Montesilio, and Christopher Bernido. Maybe if you have any questions, just kindly uh, raise your hand. So, um, yeah, so these are uh, really interesting. So I, this is a bit out of my um, my field, but I, I'm, I'm interested to know, like, how do you actually get um, this, um, you know, this symbionts from, from the shipworm? Uh, does the shipworm still survive or do? No, we take the, we take a piece of wood we, uh -huh. uh, that we suspect has shipworms or else if we've had it in a tank and we can see the, the, um, let me see, wait, the, uh, the, the siphons, we know they're in there. Then we go at it with um, chisels and, and woodworking tools and expose the shipworm. Then we remove the shipworm and under a dissecting scope, we dissect it and remove the gill. Okay. So once you have the gill, then that gill gets homogenized in a buffer and then plated on um, a medium that we know supports the shipworm symbionts that we've succeeded in isolating so far. And then when colonies form on that Petri dish, then they get transferred and the culture gets purified and then mm -hmm. uh, stored and then it be, gets characterized. Usually we start by sequencing the 16S and then um, figuring out where it fits in the big picture of the shipworm symbionts that we've seen before. And if it's something new, then we try to, uh, to sequence the genome. Okay, and of all the work that has been done already, uh, I just wanted to know, is there a way to uh, artificially synthesize the chemicals that, that, that are found um, in the shipworms? Like, I know that they have certain types of applications. So you mentioned that uh, they can fight against certain types of bacteria, but um, it, has there been work on trying to replicate this and produce them artificially in a laboratory? So yes, um, in the nobilamides uh, have been worked at at UP and a synthesis has been developed for them. Um, those actually, those are not shipworm compounds. Those come from a, from a cone snail. Um, so I would say that theoretically it's probably possible to, to synthesize the Turner cyclomycins, but it's actually, if you get a decent yield from the bacterial culture, mm -hmm. it's cheaper oh. and easier to produce them that way. Um, where you where you really need the synthesis is if you want to start making very targeted structural variations to try to work out the mechanism of action. Mm -hmm. um, that's called a structure activity relationship mm -hmm. study, and that's really important um, in order to understand how the molecule works and maybe design a simpler version of it that mm -hmm. could be made synthetically cheaply. But some of these monster big molecules like the tartalones. And the uh, and the Turner cyclomycins are not trivial to synthesize, and so you have to be further along. I mean, like with in vivo studies in animals, to know for sure this is really likely to be a drug that you put that effort in. Okay, thank you. And I, think and I would ask Giselle to jump in yes. and, and answer any chemical questions that I bought. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Giselle's actually raising her hand. Giselle, you're still on mute. So yeah. So uh, thanks for that, Marco. Uh, well, I'll start with a question and then I'll just relate some of the things that are happening in the lab, now led by Lilibeth uh, Salvador Reyes, who's here with us. And let me just say, uh, Margo, that's great work um, with, a, with the new compounds that you are also testing in clinical isolates um, uh, from, I imagine, the University of Utah Hospital, is yes. it? Yes. And I'd like to know what's the next step after that. So if you have positives in the clinical isolates or the drug resistant ones, do you have already a model for an in vivo study? Because we're moving towards that with our two or three uh, compounds that we are pursuing in the in UP. And I'll tell you a bit more about that after your Yeah, so we're, we are writing a proposal right now to you know, fund those in vivo studies. And Eric's the one who's been looking into the different model systems and um, 
there's, you know, the Acinetobacter baumannii is a fairly new pathogen, and there's not really, really good um, uh, animal models for it the way there are for, say, tuberculosis or other much more heavily studied diseases. So we're working on it. That's really all I can can say. We haven't done any animal studies yet. That's where it has to go. Nobody's going to pay any attention to this until we have right. some animal studies. But it's an, un, so, you know, this bacterium doesn't, isn't, it's not really a pathogen in, in the sense that it didn't evolve and it doesn't make its living by killing people. It's a soil bacterium that when an IED blows up and it gets driven into a person's body deeply, then it can grow where it would never be otherwise. And in the, you know, in, in the hospitals, it's in the ICU when it can creep down the central lines and things like that, that it, that it makes people sick. So it doesn't have, um, you know, like a, a well-defined invasion strategy, like, you know, um, uh, COVID for example, which, you know, makes you, makes aerosols and gets into your lungs and then invades and all that. So there's still a lot to learn about it. So, um, well, I don't know if there are other questions, but at this point, I just like to update um, everyone uh, about what's going on in UP, despite the lockdown from COVID. And it's nice because uh, uh, the uh, former uh, USEC of the DOST and still current uh, uh, chair of the technical panel of Tuklas Lunas, Ami Guevara is here. Thanks so much, Amy, for joining us. And she gave us the go signal, Marco, for trying to um, pursue our ICBG compounds, uh, which are not formally funded by the DOST. But then after our grant, uh, well, uh, ran out, then we know that um, we have uh, the UPEIDR program uh, is funding Lilibeth's uh, research to continue the shipworm work okay but this is fabulous the nice, there's so much yes there's so much yes, to be so done. much involves isa you and joyce ibana and others and um well uh, nice to know uh, marco that um our uh ttbdos of up uh, diliman and manila got together their heads and they have facilitated uh the 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 identification of a lab group in UP Manila College of Public Health, who will uh, provide us the clinical isolates uh, to test our compounds in. And you know that we have compounds that are active against methicillin resistant Staph aureus. We have one active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa and another that's um, active in a model of biofilm um, uh, inhibition. So um, they're all on a, filing for patent application. Uh, in the US, you have the provisional patent method uh, of filing um, early on at a, at a low cost. Here in UP, uh, we established the invention disclosure system prior to uh, identifying uh, the priority inventions or discoveries for patent application on that patent application uh, you know, um, pathway. So uh, it's very exciting because those uh, infections that we're working on, Margo, are very important nosocomial infections. I was hoping some of our MDs would be here, uh, the, ones, the ones based in PGH and UP Manila, but they have clinic this morning. The, the great yeah. thing is this recording will be posted on our website uh, in, uh, in a few days. But at this point, if there's anything that Ami would like to say or Lilibet would like to um, say. Yeah. Giselle, I think we have a question from Professor oh, Sean Raimundo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah. Um, she's asking, Dr. Haywood, since these shipworms are cellulase degraders, would they have unique cellulase system that can probably be used in the industry, like fast-acting celluloses under harsh environments or, yeah, mean cellulose, yeah, mean cellulose degraders? Absolutely, absolutely. The, these shipworm symbionts have hundreds of cellulases in their genome and they, they express certain ones, I think perhaps depending on the, on the wood that the, that the animal is inhabiting, but their, their potential is truly enormous. And you know, it's one of the, 
disappointments of the PMS ICBG that we didn't, we weren't able to link with either engineering professors or industry to be able to, to get some interest going in that. I think there is a huge potential for that. Uh, yeah, there's another question about the lifespan of shipworms. They, well, we don't actually, there's no, there's not enough research on that. The ones that have been studied the most generally live a relatively short time because once they fill up the wood, they can't, uh, they can't disperse somewhere else. They, once they've settled and entered the wood, they can't go on to another piece of wood. And so they reproduce and they die. Some of the larger shipworms maybe live for quite a long time. But the question that was asked is, does the activity of the bacteria change as the shipworm ages? This is something we would really love to study because the shipworm gill um, grows from the anterior end. And the work that's been done on other bivalves that have symbionts shows that the symbiont is being established anew at, at, at I mean, sorry, the posterior end, at the posterior end. And so this means that they could actually change the combination of symbionts as the animal matures and maybe um, needs different things from its symbionts. And so that's a wide open area that hasn't been studied at all yet. Wow, amazing. I think we have another question from Lily Beth. Hey, Margo, yeah. how are you? Hi, uh, Hi. Uh, Okay, so I have uh, two questions. One would be um, from the biosynthetic gene clusters. Um, do we have an idea how much would be cryptic? Well, that's one of those things that's really hard to, to know for sure, because um, we may not be growing them in the conditions that right. stimulate them to make a particular mm -hmm. compound or mm -hmm. like the Turner cyclomycins. We've been studying, you know, uh, Teranidobacter turnerase T7901, which is where this came from, from, I mean, from, you know, from the 1980s. And um, it was 2013 that, that Sharif found the tartalons and the tartalons are made at such a high level that they tend to mask other things that are there. So we now have mutants um, that don't make tartalons that might make other things easier to see. But what Bailey found was that you couldn't see the Turner cyclomyces in the crude extracts under the normal procedures that we follow. It was hiding in this boundary layer, right? So they're, they can hide, they can be cryptic biologically and they can be cryptic chemically, both. Yeah. So, um, so that, but that is the reason for the interest in, in trying to either clone the pathways and drive them using a strong promoter or put the strong promoter into teridinobacter ternary in front of some of these pathways that we are that we can't figure out what they're making. It's step by step very slowly, but um, I think it's very likely that there are probably certain environmental triggers for certain of these pathways to be expressed. And we may not know what those are, may not know for a long, long time. So we have to be sneaky, clever. Yeah. So, which brings me to my second question, which would be the um, optimization or do you have to like optimize the, um, the conditions for the cultures for the production to increase the production of Turner cyclamycin as maybe an alternative to, you know, um, organic synthesis? Well, actually the Turner cyclamycins, once you know how to isolate them are made at a pretty good level. Okay. Actually, I think that the, the most uh, you know, it's, it's the work at MSI that's been going on uh, characterizing the tartalon production in the huge collection of Teridinobacter ternary strains um, in the collection there that to me shows some potential um, because we know from studies in other, in other bacteria that if you isolate a hundred strains of the same species that has the same pathway, some of them will be high producers and some of them won't. Correct. So to some extent, it's a matter of working through that gargantuan collection um, to look for the ones that are volunteers, so to speak. Okay, so I'll just also just like to respond to the uh, questions of uh, Dr. Concepcion and also uh, 
Dr. Uh, Sean Raimundo, right? So the EADR project now is um, with together with uh, Dr. Isa Yu is expressing the doing the recombinant expression of the cellula cellulases, the KDs characterized from our shipworm symbionts. And then we're also moving towards the um, metabolomics of the shipworm isolates. So with Dr. Hias Junio from chemistry and we're doing the co-culture also as a way, possibly a way to express cryptic metabolites with Dr. Joyce Ibana from UPIP. So it's um, continuing work, our continuing work on this um, shipworm symbionts. That is great. And I think that the co-culture is a really good idea because we suspect that one of the functions of these compounds may be for competition within the gill. Right. So co-culturing with other shipworm symbionts may trigger some interesting compounds. Okay. Thank you, Margo. Thank Thanks. You, it's, good to, it's good to talk to you. That was great. Um, Giselle, do you have anything else to say? Yes. Yeah, I think um, industry would be very interested in the cellulases, but let's expand it to um, uh, not just, uh, you know, the agricultural uh, waste uh, uh, processing uh, that's uh, good for industry. Remember when we had our initial uh, experiments making use of, uh, of um, well, not rice, because that's not cellulose-based, it's uh, sil silica-based, right? But sugar and other crops. But there's some interest from... Um, uh, PTRI, that's the Philippine Textile Research Institute of uh, the DOST, on how to improve the quality of our fabrics, Margo, which are mm -hmm. very interesting. Softening of fabrics, making use of cellulases, or in the case of um, uh, finding materials, natural materials for 3D printing or additive manufacturing, where you combine synthetic uh, polymers with natural polymers like uh, the nano uh, crystalline cellulose, cellulose, say from Abaca or Copra, Gobeta Dincula and others in this field would be interested to see how, you know, the cellulases could help improve the quality of the materials that could be used for 3D printing and additive manufacturing. I think there's tremendous potential for that. Yes. Okay. There's yeah. another question about the yeah. uh, transmission of the symbionts from parent to offspring. And yes. this is an area that's really wide open for, for investigation. We know um, that the genomes of the symbionts, for the most part, they look like free living bacteria. They have a, a normal size genome, four to five megabases. They don't have a lot of genome deterioration like an obligate symbiont. So it's quite possible that they could be recruited from the environment. And to some extent, we, well, we don't know where the bacteria live when they're not in the shipworm, but if they are colonizing the wood that the shipworm is colonizing, then the right bacteria are there already. So mm -hmm. that seems to me like that would be a good strategy. But I think we're seeing a fairly young symbiosis that may be evolving toward a more obligate symbiosis. And so we may have some symbionts that are that are more directly transmitted than others, particularly in the species that brood their larvae inside their body, there's a possibility for direct transmission. For the ones that just are broadcast spawners, um, what little we know, what very little we know, suggests that the, the larvae, when they are ready to settle, are not colonized and that they are acquiring their symbionts from the environment. It's a but you know, that's speculation. There's really not a lot of hard, hard evidence. And there's so many different shipworms all doing different things. Hey, thank you so much for that, Margo. All right, thank you. I think uh, we, we don't have any more questions and it was a really interesting talk. Um, yeah, so, but before we end this particular session, I'd like to uh, just share my screen to invite everyone for the activities of Paase. Okay, so for those of you who are not yet aware, so uh, we have our website, so you can go visit it at paase.org. So I am showing it to you now. So I hope that you can see it. So we have announcements on, hold on, there's something on the chat. Okay, so there are announcements on upcoming activities. So we announced this lecture there. And then for next week, 
we will be having a forum that has been organized by one of the research expertise clusters, particularly on disease medicine, pharmaceuticals, and biomedical engineering. So there will be a panel of speakers in that particular event. So if you're interested to join, um, this will be happening next week at the same time, 8 o'clock in the morning. And if you visit our website, paase.org announcements, you can directly see the link for that particular forum. So you can just join and click uh, this particular link. So in addition to that, we also have their um, other activities for upcoming weeks. And um, we also want to invite you for our um, annual Paase meeting and symposium, which will be happening uh, this October in, uh, yeah, in Baltimore. Okay, so we have our announcement posted there. So if you're interested to send in an abstract uh, for a presentation, please uh, feel free to do so. And this will be a hybrid um, conference. So they will be meeting face-to-face -face in the US, but they will also accommodate online uh, presentations. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much again, Margo, for that very wonderful presentation. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks lots, Margo. Thanks, uh, Kay. You're the best. <laughs> thank That's you, Jen. Lovely to see everybody. Yes, yes it is good to have. You're looking great, Margo.